Porsche, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, thank you guys so much for coming. It's really uh, amazing to see so many people here. And it's exciting to talk about pediatrics and integrative pediatrics. We have a great uh, team here. So I um, have my office in Studio City called Integrative Pediatrics and Medicine. I did all the regular Western training. I trained at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, but got super frustrated with the regular system. So that's what made me start learning about functional medicine and other topics like that. And I'm the founder of integratedpediatrics.com. And so we'll get a lot into what integrated pediatrics is. And he has an upcoming uh, pediat integrated pediatric summit and a course that's yeah. going to be available soon. We are uh, working on a summit for the for the website. It's going to be in March, and we have a whole bunch of celebrities like Hilary Duff, Haley Duff, a bunch of uh, top experts uh, from around the world that are going to talk about pediatrics. It'll be all free for uh, anybody who wants to watch it, and uh, that will be coming up. So we'll get you more information. Okay, time. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm John Metric. I own the. Yes. I thought it was loud enough. Uh, I own the Balanced Brain Neurofeedback Center of Hollywood. I happen to be in Joel's building now. Just moved in a couple of months ago. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. It's. Uh, I need to hold, hold the mic a little closer. Yeah. No, I don't think that's does not work. It says it's on. Hello, hello. That's not working. I'll just talk loud. Um, I'm thrilled. I, I'm just delighted to be in Joel's building. It's just turned into like this holistic building. It's, it's amazing. I, I started. I, there we go. Anybody out here know anything about neurofeedback? No, I'm just going to die out of the name. One, two, a couple. No, that died too. <laughs> I'll just wait. So a couple of people know about it. Anybody who doesn't, the shortest way to say it is it's a direct connection with brain signals. We present them back to the person sitting in the chair. It can be a child, it can be an adult, it can be a senior citizen, it doesn't matter. We train the brain's signals for better function, for, to be more regulated. The regulation of the brain is vital to all of the behaviors that you can think about, from ADHD to anxiety to whatever. So that's the, our zone of expertise. What, I lo what I'm loving about being here is that I got exposed to uh, I got exposed to functional medicine by being in the broken brain. I didn't know much about it, frankly. So here I am going, here's a whole room full of people that I really need to know what you guys do, and I'm trying to inform myself more about it as well. And so I'm, I'm happy to integrate that, and we are integrating that into our work here on the, just on the brain side. So I, I think they work hand in hand. I'm in Denver Denver. Denver. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Dr. Alec Peckler. Um, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I also trained as an environmental toxicologist. I have a master's in environmental toxicology from UCLA. Uh, I work with Dr. Warsh uh, in his office, and I specialize in children with special needs. I have a 12-year-old <coughs> son with Down syndrome, autism. Uh, who I was frustrated um, and couldn't really get any help from conventional medicine. Um, so I decided to become an ashpathic doctor and I treated with the help of uh, numerous practitioners and he's doing really well, uh, basically very, he's verbal, he's uh, can read, uh, can answer questions, understand is, is pretty good. Uh, and he's, he's active, you know, he used to be lethargic and now he has a lot of energy. So, here I am. Okay. I think so. Is this better? Yeah. I think yeah. this is better. Hi everybody, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Yes. Uh, Hi, so my name is Loriko Zeki, and I'm a physician of Asian medicine, um, but I specialize in pediatrics. I've been doing Asian medicine, acupuncture, herbs, uh, dietary modification, the whole gamut of Chinese medicine for 12 years, but I've been doing pediatrics now for eight years, and I went into pediatrics because Chinese medicine um, is a whole complete medical system that's been in practice from over millennia, and as you know, Chinese are a big population. They needed to take care of their children back 1,000, 2,000 years ago. So pediatrics as a specialty has been part of Chinese medicine forever. It just wasn't really practiced as much in the States. Um, but I knew there was uh, uh, that department or that specialty. So I seeked out both in Japan and here in the States to learn how to treat children without using needles. So in Japan, there's a whole system called shonishin, which are the use of small 
mostly metallic instruments, tiny little metallic instruments that mimic the effect of acupuncture without having to treat children, without having to needle children. So I treat from babies, literally a day old, to even senior citizens who are very fragile or very um, frail people who needles might be too stimulatory. So the whole show niching technique is wonderful for any population if they're needle phobic or, uh, or fragile. And so I treat pediatrics as a specialty, but my practice is also a family practice. Mothers, mostly mothers, some husbands, and their children. And I have a practice in West LA and also in Westchester by LAX. So, I'm going to start with the questions, but feel free to raise your hand and, and jump in. Since it's cold and flu season, I thought it would be appropriate to ask, uh, you know, what are the most, uh, well, actually, we decided we were going to talk a little bit about what is integrated pediatrics. Why don't we start there, Dr. Warshin? So it, it's a great question because I don't think there is a definition of integrated pediatrics. Everybody has a little bit of a different one. But to me, it's blending the best of Western medicine with alternative or holistic medicine. And I think a lot of our goal and hope in the future is that there shouldn't even be that term. It should just be medicine. And we should do whatever is best on the day. And it shouldn't just be you know, Western medicine, Western medicine, Ayurveda, homeopathy, supplements, whatever it is, blending those together for the best outcome for the patient and doing whatever is most minimal. And I think what's frustrating is that it's so divisive on both sides right now in regular society. And you know, people are, if you do anything in the alternative world, it's crazy. And, or if you're totally in the alternative world, then Western medicine is crazy. But we know that there's a lot of great treatments in Western medicine, and we've come a long way. And so we don't want to forget that. But we also are forgetting a lot of what used to be done, and we're not focusing on the foundations anymore, and obviously something's not working because people keep getting sicker and sicker. We know that kids are getting closer to 50% chronic disease, and that's where you look. Adults are more than 50% chronic disease, so we're obviously doing something wrong. Okay, great. So uh, let's start with colds and flus. Uh, you know, obviously we're uh, in the midst of cold flu season, and now we have some new deadly coronavirus coming mm -hmm. from China. And uh, so, what are what is the most effective strategies for uh, <laughs> um, dealing with colds and flu? So, for me, the place that we always start is the foundations, and, and the term that I've coined now is seeds. So, the seeds of health being sleep, exercise, environment diet and stress, and this is something that we've really forgotten in Western world now, where we're kind of <coughs> all about Instagram and Facebook and social media, and no one's remembering that we need to eat healthy. Most of our food is not very good, people are forgetting that they need to get a good amount of sleep, we're surrounded by toxins, and so really the first thing that you can do to support yourself and support your kids is to think about the basic, easy things that you can change at home without even spending a cent or maybe you know, spending a very little amount of money, but things that you have control over. So I think the biggest two are probably diet and the, our environment. And so diet, thinking about toxins, what we're eating, trying to have a healthier diet, get rid of uh, you know, all the, the sugar and the chemicals, and then when it comes to the environment, thinking about the toxins and all the things that you have around you. So the cleaners that we're using, the products that we're putting on, uh, the sunscreens that we give our kids, there, there's so much crap in all of that, and, and there are options that are not necessarily more expensive, um, but that can make a huge difference in decreasing that in general inflammation. Now those are good general ideas, but what about right now? You know, my, my kids coming down with the flu, or maybe every, every all the other kids in his class have the flu. What can we do now? Some of the things that you could do now I would say would be just general immune support. So you can think about uh, what we know most people are deficient in. So like vitamin D can be very helpful. Vitamin C can be helpful. Well, how, how much vitamin D is appropriate for? Well, it would depend on each kid and you know, their size, obviously, with most things. But and, and a lot of this stuff varies depending on what you read. But you can see a lot of people do like a thousand to five thousand milligrams per unit units of vitamin D. So usually it comes in like a thousand drop, drops or four hundred drops. But there's not a with kids it's hard because a lot of this information doesn't even exist. There's not studies on this stuff. So so but let's say uh, an eight-year-old kid is in your office 
they have the flu, um, and you don't, you don't have a vitamin D test, what are you gonna do? You probably could tell them to do 1,000 to 2,000 units of vitamin D. Okay. Uh, think about some vitamin C, take some elderberry. How, how much vitamin C? Uh, like 250, maybe. 250 milligrams yeah. multiple times a day, once a day, mm -hmm. every hour? You can do it two or three times in the first day, I would say. Okay. What about a higher dosage of Sinai? Is that okay? It's, it's okay, but it, it's hard because you never know with kids how they're going to react. So it's always better to start low and go up. But that's where it's hard. You know, the first time they're doing it, which is something What's your spike in C? Why can't I give them a thousand milligrams? You could theoretically, but everybody could have a reaction. And so, especially with kids, you want to start more gently. What kind of reaction? I mean, like TI? So for vitamin C, you can have lots of diarrhea. I mean, you could be allergic to anything. You never know how kids are going to react to stuff. In general, they react really well. Um, but I think because there's not a lot of information out there, it's always safest to start on the lower end and work your way up, as opposed to going really high and then having to come back down. Um, and a lot of the stuff, you know, you read the label and it's just really sick right now. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, they can take a lot of silicone side. You can take as much silicone side as you want. Okay, that's a whole start there. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> You want to what, jump in? What about you, Dr. Okay. Um, uh, so I'm a little more brave. <laughs> so I, I've dealt with my uh, child. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I, I've, I've dealt with my child with this for so long. Uh, children with Down syndrome have, uh, they constantly sick. <clears throat> the immune system is not working really well. So um, I work with a lot of naturopathic doctors, old school naturopathic doctors, you know, who are treated children for 30 years. And I, I found one in Utah 10 years ago, and he was just a, hey, you know, 10,000 units of vitamin D to a two-year-old for five days, and 50,000 units of vitamin A for a few days, and then uh, vitamin C, one gram every two hours, and zinc, you know, 15 uh, micrograms a day, and herbs and so on and so forth. And it, it basically uh, was helping, but I, I, didn't, <coughs> I didn't realize that, you know, it was always talking about the diet, you know, reducing, removing dairy and sugar and so on and so forth. And you don't, when you are um, already preconditioned to, to have this in your diet for 10, 20, 30 years, it's difficult to remove it. But once that was removed, uh, uh, basically he was telling me just fast him, you know, just lots of water or, or um, uh, a lot of chicken soup uh, and uh, let him let him sleep, let him rest. Don't be, he doesn't need to eat right now. And it worked really well. And that's what I pretty much do right now with the children. I started similar, similarly a little bit lower that he was recommending, but I always around pop as soon as I see everything is okay. And um, there's many other things you definitely can do, like some. What about Elderberry? Elderberry or, or Zekinesia, gold, Golden Seal, yeah, right, uh, Astragalus, right, uh, a lot of which, which of those are the most effective? Mm -hmm. uh, I think all of them. I usually uh, give either product that has all of them, independent of the symptoms, you know, is there a runny nose, is there a throat, so throat is there ear infection, is there a fever, so you try to uh, basically you know, see the whole picture and, and see what needs to be at this point and you know, how much of it. Uh, and, zinc lozenges? You know, uh, if, if there's any uh, complaints, you know, throat complaints, definitely uh, zinc blood gargle if, if the kid can. If, if not, uh, you can do uh, take a saline solution, put a little bit of essential oils, oregano, a thyme, uh, take a swab and literally go in in the throat and just swab it really well a few times a day. It works really well to, to kill the bacteria, the viruses. Swab clear side of the yep. throat. Yeah, well, what about if you're you brave enough, yeah. <laughs> what about your nose? Nose, he can do the same thing. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, you know. Uh, it, what about it, uh, some of the herbs in a steam? Steam, right. Uh, uh, steam is a little bit difficult depending on, on the age of the child, but nebulizer, you can use it definitely. Uh, saline solution, a little bit of salt water with a little bit of essential oils and breathe it 20, 30 minutes, two, three times a day works really well to remove the congestion. Uh, osteo osteopathy, craniosacral therapy, um, uh, chiropractic manipulation is also excellent to just open up the sinuses, open up the ears and, and nose so we can drain better. So there's so many things we can do. <coughs> 
So in Chinese medicine, um, again, because it's such an old medicine, people have been sick with colds and flus and <laughs> whatever. Um, colds and flu pandemics and uh, epidemics. So there's a system in Chinese, there's several systems in Chinese medicine that sees uh, upper respiratory infections <laughs> upper respiratory infections. Um, we have a whole system starting from what's called superficial diseases, where it's something that attacks you from the outside. We usually call um, wind is one of the uh, hundred carriers of diseases. So if you know any acupuncturists like myself, you'll see us wearing um, scarves during the winter or windy days because if the wind attacks us in the neck, we say that that then enters our body and causes us to get sick. That's one of the reasons. And then also there's dietary, like both um, Joel and uh, Alec were mentioning, diet is a big part. Um, lack of sleep um, or lack of resting is another problem. So when something attacks us superficially, the first symptoms that we get are sneezes, itchy eyes, maybe a little bit of a scratchy throat or a tight kind of stiff neck. Those are what we call the first superficial symptoms that people, children as well as adults feel. And as parents, I think you would know the first sign that a child shows. Like my, for me, as, I, as when I was a child, my mom knew that I was sick when my eyes got glassy. With my son, it's his first sneeze. I know, oh, he's caught it, and we call that he caught wind. Literally, not the farting wind, but the wind from the outside. So if you know your child has that particular first symptom, the most important thing to do is to get them to start sweating so that the, the wind or the pathogen doesn't enter deeper into the body. So by uh, sweating, you can have them, um, well, not go exercise because they might be fighting something, but like put them in a room that's warm, put them in a shower that's warm, or you can give them herbs, and herbs can be food like garlic, onions, I and mean, it's hard to get kids to eat that, but if you can find them some kind of, like soups are great for that reason because it's nourishing in terms of liquid, it hydrates you. When you catch a cold, your body tends to be cold, literally, so you're more susceptible to catching a cold. So when you warm your body up drinking hot soups, and, and ideally clear broth soups, not like the tomato based or the cream based, but clear broth soups that put a lot of garlic and onion and those more diaphoretic type of herbs in there, when the child drinks that, it makes them sweat. And when they sweat, most likely you're able to push out the pathogen out of your body as opposed to going in deeper, which when it goes deeper, then you start to get the cough, you start to get the phlegm, and then literally it goes into the chest, which we want to avoid. So in terms of um, treatment, when your child first has any signs or any pediatric patients, we offer Chinese herbs. Um, there's, thankfully, Chinese herbs aren't yummy. Who here has had Chinese herbs? <laughs> yeah, it sucks. It's yucky. You can't get a kid to eat it or drink it. We know that. That's the problem for us Chinese medicine practitioners. But there's certain companies now that make specific tinctures for children that are alcohol slash glycerin based that makes it more palatable. It's not chocolate sauce, it's not grape juice, but it makes it more palatable. So we provide these specific tinctures that are made for children. It's adult, most of them are adult formulas that have been formulated for children by either including glycerin, so it's not as potent, or we add specific herbs for children, like renshen or ginseng, for a child that's too strong. Um, what we use is something called taizushen, which is more for children. So instead of putting an adult, like a renshen or ginseng in it, we'll put something like a taizushen, which is more appropriate for children. And do, you have, do you have a company that you like, like Conherb? Yeah, so Conherb is one, and Conherb is available, um, can I talk about where it's available? Sure. Um, you can find them on Emerson, and I think also Full Script is I think what it's called. Um, there's also a line called Blue Poppy that carries children's formulas. Um, and then there's also a company called Golden Flower that, ch that carries children's formulas. And so based on what the child is presenting, if you're not sweating and you have a tight neck and you're feeling cold, that's what we call a wind cold. The cold is more predominant versus someone who's got a stronger fever who might be sweating, they might be having a wind heat. So based on the presentation of the patient, you prescribe particular herbs that either cools the person down if they're having wind heat or if they're having wind cold, you want to give them warming herbs. But generally, when they first, when you or your loved ones or your patients catch a cold, the first thing you want to do is get them warm to, to increase the metabolism so that they can strengthen their immune system and fight off the pathogen. So that's how we see it. But food is really important. Oftentimes, as we know, Halloween comes, kids get sick a day, a week later. Why? All that sugar. 
And of course, all, a lot of dairy that children tend to eat. Sugar and dairy are, and gluten are very glowing, as we say, to our bodies. It really slows down metabolism. It slows down the chi. So instead, if you can get things to be flowing better by either sweating, exercising, drinking more fluids, abstaining from too much dairy and gluten, and instead bringing in non-dairy alternatives or non-gluten um, grains, it's much better for the body. The body's less likely to, when they catch what we say when, it's less likely to get stuck and get you sick. The, the whole notion of Chinese medicine is you want energy to be constantly flowing like a river. The more the river's flowing, you're not gonna have a dam where things start to fester and get sick, yeah? Whereas if there's a clean river, river flowing, everything is thriving in the river and in the lands around it. Same thing with the body. The more energy is flowing freely with no stagnation, the healthier you are. You mentioned fever. Fever. Um, what does everybody think about fever? A lot of parents panic about fever and they give the kids to see them like open and, and ibuprofen and, and are uh, worried about fever. What, what should we think about fever? Uh, fever is probably the most common night call that I get from parents, I would say. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you get that as well. And I think it's, it's a fear and an unknown of, of what really fever is and not really understanding that it's a normal <laughs> process to something going on. So obviously we have you know, some sort of illness, we have a reaction in the body, it affects your hypothalamus, raises the temperature. But there's good reason for that. It's, it's increasing your metabolism, it's moving white blood cells around your body, it's raising the temperature to a level where hopefully the pathogen won't be hospitable. So I think having a little bit of conversation with your patients is really important for them to understand and, and to kind of break it down by what is serious versus what is not serious. And obviously if you're getting super high fevers above 105, that's something you want to get checked. If it's a newborn baby, the first 105, do you think it's cut uh, I think most doctors will say 105 is, is pretty high. Um, 103 is where you know, a lot of people will say, okay, well, it's, it's getting pretty high, but if there's not really any other symptoms around that, doesn't mean you have to rush to the hospital right now, you probably should get seen. If the fever's not too high, uh, is it a good idea to actually encourage more fever? Like, is it a good idea to uh, wrap the kid up in a bunch of blankets? Most of the studies that, that I have uh -huh. seen say that the, if you don't use Tylenol or Motrin, then usually the, the sickness will be a little bit shorter, maybe like a half day shorter or so if you're not using it. So uh, it, it usually depends on, at least when I talk to my families, it's if the kid's are really uncomfortable, fine and reasonable to do it every now and again. It's not something you want to use all the time. And if, but if your kid has a one or two fever running around and playing, you don't need to use Tylenol for that. And, and most of the time, they're, if you don't come down on its own, you can do natural, you know, like a bath, Epsom salt, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you tell your patients? Uh, me, uh, fevers, I think, are great to an extent, for sure. It's, it's your body's way of fighting an infection. And as uh, Joel, Dr. Warsh mentioned, it's, it's good for the body to have these infections so that the body can learn to fight an infection appropriately. When you use uh, fever reducers, the body is told, don't fight an infection. And that's a problem because you need to learn how to be able to fight an infection. Um, I take that even beyond. When the body learns how to fight an infection appropriately with using their own resources or using the help of natural medicine, and maybe some Tylenol or something if it's too high, of course, but if the body learns to be able to fight an infection appropriately and in a very healthy way, it imprints in the body that your body's resilient, literally in your cells and in your psyche, that your body's strong, you can fight this. And as you have these milestones of catching colds and flus and you get, you get sick but you get better, it imprints in your psyche that when time comes that you have a challenge, you literally know that you can overcome this. Mm -hmm. We tend to overprotect our children now. Mm -hmm. Don't touch anything, antibiotics, everything. You can't do anything by yourself. I'm going to protect you. And we know the problem now with uh, younger generation children is they fall apart under some form of duress or little duress. And what we need to teach our children is resilience. And by having fevers, it teaches us that, yes, we can overcome a fever. And that translates to, yes, I can overcome this struggle in front of me. I, I didn't pass my exam. I didn't get into this you know, company that I wanted to. But these little milestones and, and challenges that you overcome teaches us to be more resilient human beings. And I think fever is that gateway to teach us. So the more you can support a child to go through a fever healthily, like he said, as long as they're not 
uh, having malaise, if, if, if they're not vomiting, if they're not obviously fainting, but they're able to kind of hang around and play a little bit or just quietly read a book, even if they have a fever, it's fine. If they're not eating, like he said, it's okay because your body's focusing on fighting. Just give them soups and cooling or not maybe suits, but liquids to keep them hydrated. And then if they start to then have symptoms like they're starting to lose consciousness, that's when you really, or if you're starting to get there at 105, call your doctor. But some things you can do to reduce fever in Chinese medicine, right here at the base of your neck at C, uh, C14, no, C7. Sorry, it's called Do 14 of Chinese medicine. It's an acupuncture point, Do 14. We usually needle that to clear heat. Most of the yang that comes to the body meets here at C7, or what's called Do 14, governing vessel 14. When you needle that, you release the heat so that it's not rising so much. In children, you wouldn't needle them because, right? So when you peck C7, you just peck it like either several times like this or with a little bit of a nail and kind of get into it to just stimulate as if you're needling the, the child. That will help to release some of this heat that's rising. Another thing is heat rises, you want to bring it down. Cold, cold socks techniques. Have you guys know of that technique, right? Lemon and cold water uh, in the socks and then wrap your feet of those wet socks over, use wool socks or dry socks over that wet socks and go to sleep. That literally drains the heat away from the head, the top body, and then the fever starts to go away. Another thing with pediatrics is children tend to get fevers from malabsorption or malnutrition, eating too many foods that don't suit them well. Too much dairy, too much sugar, too much gluten, and not enough vegetables. So they get indigestion. And when that indigestion doesn't have the opportunity to have a bowel movement to run out of your, to come out of your body, it generates heat because it becomes toxic. So what you also want to do is get kids to poop. If you get a kid to poop, especially if they're having distension in their stomach and they have maybe even a headache in the front here, if you get them to poop, the fever goes down immediately. So think about that with your children or your patients. If they're complaining of digestive issues with the fever, get them to poop, the fever will go down significantly or enough where they're comfortable. I just want to jump on that for a second and say that this is why, to me, integrative medicine here at Texas is so important because in, in medical school, there's so much that we learn about identifying the very serious thing. We know about the really high fever, the, the symptoms that we need to look for, and that's why having a pediatrician or, or, or a doctor is so important. You go there, you make sure that everything's okay. But then you also see, hearing from someone like Rico, how many other amazing things there are that we would never even hear about in Western medicine, and a lot of those things might work 10 times better than anything we would ever be able to do in a Western office other than say, okay, take Tylenol and you'll be fine in five days. Right? There's all these other things out there, and that to me is what getting that exposure to the other side is. And, and you know, there's, I, I learned some homeopathy, some supplements, some Asian medicine, but there's a lot that you can get from learning it for 30 years versus learning it for a few years, and going to someone who's done this their whole life is completely different. And, and so, you know, to me it's frustrating that we think that, you know, this is alternative medicine. It's Western medicine is really new. These things have been around for thousands of years, but Western medicine has been around for a couple hundred years, hundred years, whenever you want to start the date for, for Western medicine. So this is why we all need to work together in here and get this out there because, you know, you go into a regular Western office and they're going to say take Tamiflu and here's some Tylenol. And good luck. Um, you mentioned homeopathy. I, I, I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that the FDA is currently on the verge of um, eliminating homeopathy. Uh, there's a, a new pending rule where homeopathic formulas uh, will have to undergo, uh, they'll have to be tested like drugs and approved or they're not going to be allowed to be sold. And this is uh, something that's been happening around the world. We actually had an expert on homeopathy speak at our meeting last year. She did a documentary. And um, at, this started in Australia, where the government commissioned this report that said that homeopathic medications are, um, are ineffective and unsafe. And, um, and England banned homeopathics. So everybody should find out um, how we can contact the FDA and uh, make sure that um, we do everything we can to prevent homeopathics from being banned. Um, yeah. It was happening in Germany, and um, but 
it gets covered by insurance, and uh, especially the private insurances. So the government no longer covers homeopathics, but all the people who were paying for the private insurance complained, and now we <coughs> pay for them. So it has to be a groundswell movement. Um, what about allergies and uh, asthma, which are really common among kids these days? Yeah, it comes back again to the gut, <laughs> to uh, toxins and sugar. Uh, definitely in the immune system, now we're realizing that uh, most of the immune system is probably in the gut, not uh, spleen and, and bone marrow and so forth. So um, what we see is when, in my practice, when um, we heal the gut, usually asthma goes away, allergies goes away completely, there's really no uh, seasonal allergies, there's no um, uh, any kind of sensitivities for allergies definitely uh, uh, takes quite a while, maybe you know, up to a few years, but it definitely works. Can, and I, oh, um, when you get to it, um, could you talk about what are your favorite products for getting the gut? Like, for example, how do you like zeolites, uh, SPF pack, and those products? And what do you have to watch for for children versus adults? <coughs> <clears throat> so, um, when uh, when we look at the whole picture, you know, if if I feel there is a imbalance in, in, in bacteria, if we do testing, there's certain testing you can do. Um, uh, what, what type of testing is that? Um, so, uh, uh, stool testing through uh, GIFX or Dr. Theta um, and, or, or any other old bonus companies. And you look at the imbalances of uh, bacteria, yeast, viruses, parasites, um, you address those usually based, based on the testing and based on the symptoms. You know, you, know, uh, you have to go in, into detail. And, um, you know, probiotic is usually one of them. Uh, clearing, uh, killing basically the uh, gut bacteria or yeast if there's a, oh, we think there's overgrowth, also important. And during the phase, we may use uh, detoxing uh, products such as zeolite, uh, charcoal, and so, so forth. So those are the ones that you definitely can use um, uh, to help the child, uh, but you have to be, uh, I always find it to be doing it very slowly and carefully because um, A, children do not tell us, you know, what's wrong, so they don't, they may not understand that maybe whatever they're going through um, uh, is something that's, you know, related to their tummy or it could be something else. What, what type of probiotics do you like to use with kids? Uh, uh, yeah, usually, uh, or uh, mixture? It, it, I think it, it's, it's important, it depends on, um, you use a pro as broad as possible if you do not know uh, if the food which imbalance is on there in, in, in the gut. So, right, uh, like if a cell is uh, you use, uh, if you think there's yeast overgrowth, um, uh, you use, you know, yeast uh, probiotics and so forth. Right. Um, and uh, always, always, uh, this is one of the things that I learned um, to start very slowly uh, and do very carefully because um, the children, um, not adults, and they, they can react really badly to to a changes, you know, rapid changes, in especially in their gut. So if we're using, say, 30 billion uh, micro, you know, uh, bacteria for a typical adult dose, what would be an appropriate dose for a five-year-old, a 10-year-old? Yeah, um, um, so in general, um, again, really depends. Uh, I would say between uh, 10 to 50 billion is probably, I, I tend to go higher with adults if I, if I have any. Uh, 100 billion, um, but it just really depends. You know, I go from from uh, 10 billion to probably 100 billion to 500 billion, just just depending on the symptoms and what else might be going on. And then, uh, what type of uh, antimicrobial products do you like for kids for gut issues? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, with with uh, children, I usually try to go very slowly. So uh, one of my best products um, is Golden Seal probably, just anti-inflammatory and rebalances the bacteria without causing uh, too much 
issues. I start with that usually. A retina is usually very strong. Um, uh, using um, uh, uh, there was actually a pretty bad article about the coconut oil. <laughs> but using coconut oil as the microbial is excellent too. It's very really cheap and simple. You just add it to your food. Uh, it controls a lot of uh, yeast and bacteria. So, um, and I usually uh, uh, do it in combination with probiotics. Yeah, it also depends on what you're dealing with, especially if you do stool testing. If there's going to be an actual parasite in there, you might do an antiparasitic. But still, with kids, a lot of times we'll try not to. So you might do you know, products like Biocide, and even there's all sorts of you know, standard processes there. So Metagenix has theirs, the Candibacans. It just depends. And it also depends on how old the kid is and what they're willing to take. And it's all these questions become really, really hard when it comes to kids, because every kid is so different. And even you can't have any sort of standard protocol for kids. If you do, you're 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 never going to win. I mean, you obviously have your things that you like the best and your companies that you like the best. So you know the companies like Metagenics and Zymogen, and Standard Process. These different companies have decent products. But the problem is that each company has a couple of products that are, are reasonable for kids to take. Most of them are not. You know, if you're having your kid, they can't swallow pills. Their stuff doesn't taste very good. So you have to kind of pick and choose what, you, what seems to work. Um, but there isn't really a standard guide of how to do this. It's usually, at least for me, it's either talking to other practitioners or talking to other integrative practitioners and saying, hey, what did you have to do in this case? And then following along with that. Um, and most of the time, the important thing to do is to start really simply. So start with food and look at their diet, unless it's something super serious going on, even if it is you know, uh, bacteria parasite. You can still start by changing up the diet, getting up the, the chemicals, um, you know, smoothies every day, doing some prebiotics, probiotics, and uh, fish oil or something like that. And a lot of times they get better just by doing that. So you have to be really careful. And then also you have to be really careful about testing. Because these are kids. And so, you know, stool testing isn't so hard, but you want to do nutrient testing, you want to do Allergy testing, you have to say, you know, what's the yield here? Is it going to be really useful? And is it really worth taking this kid and getting them to get five you know, miles of blood or whatever it's going to be? So even if you think that's a good place to start, if you haven't done some of the other things first for a couple months, it's usually not a good idea because it's a kid. It's pretty traumatic to get five miles of blood. Um, it just depends. If they're, if they're really sick, the parents are totally fine with it, and they're coming in and saying, hey, I want to do this, you know, panels, and this is what I want to do. But in general, it's not what you should be doing, because most kids will get better on their own if you do the natural stuff. So if you do decide to do food allergies or food sensitivity testing, which is the best panel or best panels? It's changing all the time. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of people think of Cyrex as the best, but those are really expensive. Um, and you know, so that's, that's a problem for a lot of people. Um, Genova is a pretty common one that people use. We use uh, Biotech is another one. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of them. I, I think the results are, are variable. I think it's, it's very useful if you have someone that needs to have some specific evidence to work on their diet. If you have no idea what's going on, it can be really useful. But it's hard because there's so many foods that kids eat, and those tests come up wild sometimes. And I, I know, a lot of times when you do it, they, things come up positive that they never eat. So it's confusing. Mm -hmm. Um, or everything comes back perfectly normal and then the test was useless. <laughs> so, I don't know. But it still sometimes is very helpful and sometimes you do it and it points you in the right direction. It gives you a few things that you can choose. Yeah, that's especially in Oregon after yeah, they just spent eight dollars Yeah, um, but you know, the tests are not super expensive anymore. That's good. I have a question. What about GSE? Are you, are you ever using GSE in your work? Sometimes. I what, what is GS? Uh, grapeseed extract? Grapefruit seed extract. And uh, drops can be very powerful and, and antimicrobial, so antiviral as yeah. well as antibacterial. So it, it, so it's yeah. a good question. It's a controversial one because yeah. if you read the articles on it, half the people say it's the best thing, and the other half the people say it's really dangerous for kids and it's lighter yeah. fluid, so it's hard. Yeah. I've seen a lot of people use it in their protocols for thrush for babies, Gosh. so you might do a little bit diluted on, on the tongue. But again, you read about that and... Can it, can it be dangerous? Why? 
Uh, it's supposed to destroy the gut and yeah, it's just affect it. Like it's very much. potent. If it's too much, it's kind of like it's too short. So it's hard because it, it's with all of these products, when it comes to kids, you, as soon as anybody has a problem with it, then it gets blown up in the media. And so you see like a child has an issue with peppermint oil, and it's like, nobody should ever have peppermint oil yeah. again. And, and that's really difficult to manage as to how dangerous it really is because you don't know what product they use, what, what other chemical was in there. And then you have to deal with the medical world that says, okay, this is dangerous, but then they're operating some medication that has a long list, this long of known side effects, and you're comparing that to the thing that maybe might cause a reaction one time in a kid, but you're dealing with that aspect of it without enough research because we don't actually know. But logically, all these natural things don't have a lot of side effects. They've been used for thousands and thousands of years, so it should be safer most of the time. But it's, it's a good question. It's hard. When does it make sense to give the antibiotics? When does it make sense? If you have a known bacterial infection that needs to be treated, then it should be treated. So. When do you know you have a bacterial infection? Whoever actually cultures and finds out what the organism uh, is. I, I think that comes down to the experience in medicine of doing it, of, of seeing how sick the kids are. So if I have a cold for seven days, does it mean it's a bacterial infection? No. <laughs> Definitely does not. Um, I, I, for but me, you hear that all the time. Oh, you do. Well, I, I had it, it for a whole week, so obviously well, I needed antibiotics. It, again, that goes back to the culture of you know very problematic American medicine. Of, you know, you go to urgent care, you're going to get antibiotic every single time, right? And that's just the way that it is because they want to give you something to cover their butts. That's American medicine. It doesn't mean that it's wrong per se, but it just it's not really what we need to be doing. We need to be have close contact with our patients because that's how you decide when you give a prescription. If you have the ability for them to talk to you, you see if it's getting better or worse, and when they come in, if the kid's really, really sick, then it's a good time to treat them, and that's where your, your clinical assessment comes in. But if they're they're you know, a little bit of cough, they're running around playing, they're smiling, you almost never need antibiotic for that. And most of the time, if you can give the parents some other options, whether it be a supplement, a homeopathic, whatever, they're happy with that, because they want to do something for their kid. That's the really big key. When we learn in, in, in medical school residency what to do, it's just medication. So when a kid comes in to see you in, in the hospital, they expect you to give them something, right? And so nobody wants to have a sick kid and just go home and say, you're fine, it's a virus. They want to do something. So if you have other options, they're usually pretty happy with that. And if you say, if this, this, and this happens, come back or call me. And if it keeps getting worse, then that's a good time to think about it. So could I offer an option, a really good option? I used to do free classes in mommy baby massage. And massage is free. Your hands are really convenient. They're right there next to you and close to your baby. And so I'm curious. I hear about all these supplements and products and techniques and things. Has anybody ever introduced massage? Thank you. I'm a lymphatic massage specialist, and I believe that if you can get the lymph moving and flowing, you can pretty much resolve a lot of these things, just like you said, naturally. So I'm here to advocate that everybody get a lymphatic massage specialist in their practice. So I mean, and then what I do is I teach people how to do that for themselves. Then they get that symptom, and then, and then they're sitting there at home going, I know what to do. I can rub his ears. I can press on his sinuses. I can press on the back point. Their hands suddenly become very powerful and their connection to their kids too. So I'm here to advocate that. Yeah, and, and using your hands, it goes through all of the other modalities really other than Western medicine, which is, I mean, you know, you talk about Ayurveda, they have Marma, you talk about Chinese medicine, they have acupuncture, acupressure. You talk about naturopathy, they have cranial psychotherapy. So everybody else does it, and it works really well most of the time. I mean, maybe if they're having a horrible pneumonia, it might be time to go to the hospital. But other than that, you know, how many kids I've sent to Dr. Beckler who have bad constipation, one treatment, and their parents are like, what did he do? I, I don't know. I still don't really know exactly. <laughs> he works. But it works. I and mean, I know like uh, Dr. Gill, you guys have Dr. Gill, who does amazing work. And there's, there's a bunch of good uh, you know, cranial psychotherapists out there, massage therapists. So, yeah. well, one thing I, I want to say about this is, so the difficulty of having children taking medications or supplements is, yes, it's, it's a, a load on their body, for their little bodies. And so many of the supplementations and medications haven't been tested on children. 
So what happens when you bring a child to a Chinese medicine practitioner is we understand the importance literally of defecation. Every question we ask, every time a patient comes into us, we ask about their poop. How's your poop? How many times did you poop? What's the color of your poop? What's the consistency of Kids love those questions. <laughs> they get all excited. But if you get a kid, a baby, a kid, a teenager to start pooping, any medication you give it is going to start working better because it's detoxification is happening. So the, the bad stuff comes out of the body, the good stuff stays and starts to work better. So many times what I see with my patients is they'll be on certain medications for asthma, for eczema, for ADD, ADD, whatever you name it. But once they start doing Chinese medicine protocols where the energy starts to flow, the body starts to learn or remember what it's supposed to do. So the medication starts to work, A, first of all, better. And after a while, you start to have to use less medication. And part of that whole picture is, is the child pooping every day appropriately? And then, of course, the diet that they're eating. So if you get to do the massage like you're talking about, lymphatic massage, or even baby massage that you might have learned as a parent, the whole notion of skin to skin when a baby's first born, in Jap I'm, I'm part Japanese. In Japanese, the word to heal someone or take care of someone is called teate. Te means hand. Ate is a word. Ateru is to touch someone or to put your hand on someone. So hand touch is the notion of healing somebody because your hands are so powerful, especially a mother or a father, caregiver, whoever it may be. If you can, your love transfers through your hands, and if you treat a child, just that notion of being touched provides so much healing and so much positive, literally, you're transferring energy. So that then starts to flow the energy better. The medications, the supplements, the whatnot protocols, that even the diet that you feed them starts to work better. So massage is really, really important. And you say, okay, babies, we all, babies all need massage, yes. But don't forget um, elementary school age teenagers. Oh my God, when teenagers come to me, I'll start with, I don't do like deep tissue massage, it's different. The Chinese medicine massage is not like deep tissue, it's more this caressing, getting the energy to move. But when I start touching them that way, they really relax and they miss being touched because they're just like, I'm a teenager, I don't need you. But really they need this interaction with their parents or with role models. So when you start to touch them, it gives them that sense of, I can let my guard down, whether it's a child or a teenager. And many times when I'm treating my child, my, you know, I'll do wellness treatments for my own son, at night, that's when we have some of the coolest conversations. My son will start telling me what happened at school, that when I pick him up at school, from school, how was it? Fine, and that's it. But when I treat him, it starts to come up because his heart starts to open and relax, his body starts to relax. And when you're in that state, you can heal a child. When you can heal their spirit, their body starts to just heal. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe you could tell us about uh, some of the benefits of neurofeedback or where that could fit into some of this discussion. Yeah, I can't, unfortunately, I can't cure viruses or <laughs> it's not the antibiotic in any nature. My, the space I work in, and, uh, just related to the pediatrics, would be more in the line of uh, attention and focus issues, uh, ADD, autism spectrum. Um, the you know, the brain circuit dysregulation problems that present in the pediatric population, obviously in the adult population. Um, my interest in the it's where I started. My daughter has autism, and um, it was so neurofeedback was so successful for her because it helped her gain self-regulation skills and got her off all her meds. You know, I was down the psychopharmacological road like most parents are presented with when their child is diagnosed. <laughs> here's Lamictal, here's Risperdal, here's this, here's that. And so you're on this cocktail of nonsense and, and, and you lose a child. You know? and, and my experience with that led me to be in neurofeedback. At the beginning, I was doing something else completely. Um, but the, but that's, the, that's the realm I'm working in. I can't help you guys in the, in the biotics area. But in terms of if you're seeing kids coming in, I don't know your practices, I don't know exactly your populations, but if you're dealing with kids who have ADD or autism, and that's in that early presentation, that's the time to start thinking about doing something like neurofeedback. It's incredibly useful. Hi. Questions, yes? I, I'm sorry, I feel a little bit bad. I'm, I was gonna answer um, the question over here about stool stuff, and so it's a little bit backtracking, but I want to say that really quick, because I had a case where normally we would throw in antibiotics, um, a girl we tested, stool testing, we used um, diagnostic solution, GI map, and she had a mycobacterium paratuberculum that was like a, um, 
it, it, the science shows that it has a really strong link to uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And uh, she, she had all these, these gut pains and stool issues. And so uh, rather than resorting to antibiotics, where there are articles showing what antibiotics would be appropriate to use, um, she also had H. pylori, by the way. We used um, Nutramedics, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but I, I, I like it a lot. Um, it, I, when, I, when I do muscle testing, I find that almost whenever I think to use that. What is, what is, what did you just say? Uh, Nutramedics, I think it's Dr. Lee Cowden. Uh, he's, he's, um, okay, yeah. And um, I will say that um, the mother was really concerned. So after we did a, you know, completed our, uh, I think we tested, I told her let's wait three months. Um, but we did about two and a half months and we, re we repeated the test and both H. pylori and the, uh, the mycobacterium were completely cleared and her symptoms were gone. Um, my son, um, I did a stool test for him. He had been complaining of stomach pains and I don't know why, for some reason I just say whatever, buddy, you know. And then finally, let's just do a stool test. H. pylori and start use the, uh, and there's like 10 or, or 11 or 12, something like that, different um, tincture formulations. And I think they are activated, not just the herb component to it. So it has almost a homeopathic frequency component to it as well and cleared up and I just love it. So I like it because uh, they're easy to take. My son, he's four years old and he actually looks forward to taking it. They're not sweet at all, but they are not averse tasting. And so now I can, I want to throw that out as a tool because we've actually retested and I'm getting consistent results. So H. pylori is something you typically think, oh, you do the triple or quadruple therapy. You don't necessarily have to do that. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to give that as a possible tool. Nutramedics? Nutramedics. With yeah. an X at the end? Uh, with yes. an X at the end. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I know that was backtrack, but I wanted to share that. So. Which stool test? Uh, he said he used the giant app for diagnostic solutions. I wanted to come back to the question about neurofeedback. What I find is a lot of times kids are pretty stressed out. They're overstimulated by all kinds of media, um, especially when they're going through grade changes, hormonal changes. And I find that the more regulated their nervous system from the brain, the more likely they are going to be to withstand colds and bacteria and things like that. So I think that's another way to look at it. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, you know, your brain regulates everything that goes on in here. Um, your endocrine system, your adrenals, you, know, you name it. And, and it is a bi-directional system. There obviously is information flowing from the gut to the brain, and there clearly is information coming from the brain down to the gut and how to direct itself. So kids who come in with ADD, in my way of thinking, 90% of the ADD diagnoses is stress. I think it's just the inability of the brain to pay attention because it's overloaded. So neurofeedback very successfully trains self-regulation skills. And I, I, I agree with you, it goes all the way down to regulation of bowels. We work with IDS. Um, it's, um, there's a brain component to how the deeper brain structures help manage the flow of Stop. <laughs> so, uh, yes, thank you for that. I agree with you. That's the self regulation component is enormous. I didn't. Not only that. Another no, question, too, about like this, can, I, can everyone hear me without I'll, I'll repeat it. Yes, we can. Uh, also, about neurofeedback, I, um, I've had amazing experiences with sending kids to, to do this, and one child in particular it took him three hours to go to sleep every night after neurofeedback, 10 minutes. Amazing. But my biggest question is, is the, the big concern is that these are busy kids, busy parents, busy lives, and the, the places that I know, A, they want you to go three times a week for three to four months, which is very difficult, and they're charging, you know, several thousand dollars. And so many of my patients can't do that. Is there something down the pipe that maybe you can take home and do neurofeedback or where it's going to be covered by insurance or less frequent? And, because I, I know it's amazing. I'm seeing amazing. All great questions. I, yes, I think uh, eventually it will be covered by insurance. That pursuit is on. Mm -hmm. um, the, bio, the CPT code for biofeedback has been in existence for 48 years. It is a class one code. To deny it is illegal, but mm -hmm. insurance companies it's do it all the time. It's covered by American Specialties, and you're going to get $12. Well, that, that, yes, I'll hear that. 
But uh, it, it, uh, is it an expensive thing to do? Yes. The technology is expensive. The skills, the acquisitions to do this is expensive. Period. It just is. Um, uh, parents at this point are paying out of their pocket. I did, and my my clients are, the, are in the same boat. Um, Ooh, there was another part to your question. Oh, is there an at-home device? People have been, that's the holy grail of neurofeedback. Neurofeedback, the, the brain is so complicated, I, I almost caution to say, would you want to do it yourself? You know, I don't fix my own car. Um, there's a guy, he's way better at it than I am. So I think it probably for the foreseeable future will remain a clinical, yeah, there are home, at home units, I'm not saying there aren't any, yeah. there are. Neurooptimal, I'll name a few, just by brand names. Um, they're also very expensive. Um, but the, the trade-off on their efficacy is that they are much more simple machines because the, user, the end user is not trained. So if it's a parent doing this, you've got a certain limitation as to what their skill set is. Yeah, you're still better off going to a clinician. They use the car metaphor. They use the doctor metaphor. I'm not doing surgery on myself. There's a whole bunch of things I'm not doing. Uh, so we're stuck with that. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's time consuming. Yes, you have to do it regularly. It's a training. It's going to the gym. If you go to the gym and you show the guy, you know, your picture of uh, Liam Hemsworth, you go, I don't look like that. That should sail for me, but okay. <laughs> the trainer's gonna say, give me a year, you change your diet and lifestyle, and I'll get you halfway there. You know, it's, it's, it's just what it is. It takes, changing behavior in anything takes time. And I, I'm mystified sometimes when people go, well, how many sessions? Like, what, 10, 20? It's like, well, well, slow down. I don't know, first of all, you're gonna respond, you're an individual, you're gonna respond in your own time. And of course it takes a long time. I can shove your brain, like hop in the chair, and we'll put 200 volts in your head. That'll change your brain state like that. TMS will change your brain state in a hot minute. A lot of side effects, what a surprise. Our techniques are conservative. So it's a long-term incremental learning strategy that just takes time. So yeah, we, we're talking usually with my clients 30 to 50 hours. Yeah. And when you step back, you go, I could change a human behavior in 30, 50 hours, kind of magical. Yeah. And it only takes that long. So, but yes, it's expensive and yes, it mounts up. Good news is it's one time. It's not like something you have to continue to do. That's the best part of neurofeedback. We're training a permanent change of brain state. The brain is designed to find homeostasis. We're here to point the way. And once it does, it stays there. It's, it's the way it's designed. Dr. Borsch, what about integrated treatments for ADD? Um, I mean, there's so many different ones for ADD, I think. Depending on the, the level of where you start. So for me, it's always a conversation with the family about the natural things, and then also talking about what they want to go to a therapist for or not. I think that it's really important to give them both sides. Um, obviously, medication has its side effects, and it's not something we necessarily want to be on long term. But I'm also very cognizant to have that discussion with families, and I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression that it should be just integrative, because for some kids, Doing a medication can be super helpful, and you can work on the natural thing. Is there ever going to take a medication? Or what do you think is the safest? Well, I don't. I don't. I don't usually prescribe medication. They do that at the therapist. And I, I don't find it makes sense for a pediatrician necessarily to be the one prescribing. But some people are getting more into it. <laughs> I think the therapist, the psychiatrist, should be doing that more. But a lot of pediatricians are doing it, and you know, people use Adderall, or Ritalin, which is the common ones because those are what's covered. Um, but getting back to the natural part, which we're here for. Which, uh, by the way, are class two narcotics, just so everybody's clear. Yeah. <laughs> right, one carbon chain away from methamphetamines. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. like maybe even more. Yeah. 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 Adderall. I mean, Adderall is a common one that a lot of people use because it's covered. But there's a thousand other ones now. Right. Uh, but another one. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a long list, but we won't, we won't go there today. Um, but a lot of people like to start with the basics. So again, changing up the diet, uh, prebiotics, and fish oil can be really helpful. Fish oil probably has the most research of anything. It used to be a prescription fish oil, but that got taken off the market. Um, and anyways, it was really expensive. Uh, you could just use regular ones. Uh, magnesium seems to work really well for a lot of kids. Uh, amino acid seems to work really well for kids. What, what kind of dosage are magnesium and what type of magnesium? Uh, uh, it depends. <laughs> I, I like the Zymogen one, but I don't, I don't usually go with, because every kid is so different, so it depends how big, how old. It's, it's a really broad question. Magnesium 3 it seems to be the one that people are using for the brain these days. Yeah, I mean, there's blends, there's mixtures. I, 
I don't, I'm not gonna go and get one specific one because everybody does it differently. I don't have a brand. I mean, I, I use Imogen. That's all that yeah, I like, but I they're neural ones. You can uh, whatever the kid can follow tails or gels or powder. And just pick the best one for each kid. And a lot of times with these, is you start, you know, with whatever it's, it's a scoop, for half a scoop, and then you you go up to where they get tolerance or where you see an effect. But starting with a specific number, it will depend on which product you're going to use for them. Um, in well, general. yeah, I was asking what form of the I use well, a lot of times it's powder. This one because the, the magnesium powder doesn't have a taste, but it's really easy to do. But if you say the citrate, <laughs> it tends to create uh, laxity and you can do its high dosage, so maybe uh, correct. The glycinate or it yeah. might be better, right? Yep. And to, to go on the riff of what you can do at home, control your child's diet. It's number one, feed them good food, put them to sleep at time, take away their phones, turn off their crap, <laughs> and you're going to get a lot better behaviors just off out of the gate. And then obviously the supplements and diet and all other things obviously can come into play. Anybody want to jump on that? Oh, like theanine and things like that. Yeah. I mean, there's usually combos of those. Again, it's hard because there's things that you want to do, but with kids, you usually want to find something that's in combination so you don't have to do 15 different things. So that's why look, one of the products I like is uh, the Zymogen one that has the mixture of theanine, lysine, and magnesium, and that's a, an easy one to do. It's good called Neuro, Neuro, Neuromax or something. Yeah. I just have a quick question. Can we break around to the What's the early, I'll speak out. Okay. What's the, er, a question or comment? What's the earliest age you can work with children with neurofeedback? Oh, actually, you can hear me. Um, I, the youngest person I've ever worked with is three. Uh, I know I know practitioners who work with infants. As soon as a child, now there are different techniques, so you got to parse out some of that stuff. As soon as a child is visually cognizant, you can probably figure out a way to get to their brain. I put aside the stimulation technologies because that would work obviously with a brand new newborn. I'm not sure if I would do that. But our, our techniques revolve around a, a perceptive ability. The ability is to sit and perceive some visual, sensory information that's coming in, auditory, tactile. We use buzzer bears. There's lots of ways to do this. You know, you're gaining access to a system through some sensory input. That makes sense. And the other was a comment that, as far as ADHD, something that is often missed. I know we talked about stress, but also trauma. Making sure you look for trauma. Yeah, we do the ACE test. That's a part of our intake here, you know, just from the get-go. You do what? We're all, it's called the ACE test, Adverse Childhood Events Test. Uh, uh, it's awesome, um, highly validated, uh, and it really teases out um, traumatic events in kids' lives, and adults for that matter, so adults can take. Um, very sensitive to trauma. It's, the underscore is probably 90% of the people we see. Mm -hmm. We're also getting a lot of questions and interest in CBD these days too, so we're talking about ADD. I think that's the, the new one on the table. And, a lot of people are trying, a lot of people find pretty good benefits from it. I just was watching, interestingly, a, a Dr. Kazarian talk about CBD, and I, evidently, I, I don't know this, you guys probably know better than I, THC is a neuroinflammatory, and CBD is not, it's, it reduces inflammation. It's very difficult to find pure CBD oil. I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm not, I like uh, even the ones that they say, oh, it's 100%, probably not. So you're taking a risk, even taking CBD, thinking you're getting the anti-inflammatory realities when indeed it's got some THC, you're kind of working at cross purposes. Uh, Metagenics has a relationship with CBD and Dr. Harani, she spoke to me a few months ago about autism that she uses. Um, apparently, though, know, uh, products now, the company, there's one company, GW Pharma, I think, and apparently they own the rights to CBD, and um, so they haven't been asserting their that right, and now they're cracking down, so um, you're going to see a lot of products, like the Metagenics product, and they call it hemp oil, because technically, this pharmaceutical company is now not allowing any other company to call their product CBD. Oh, that's ridiculous. Of course, 
So, but I don't like CBD isolate. And if you go to my website, I have a blog about the difference between isolate and full spectrum. Like with any herbal product, if you take the marker and use the marker only, you're not going to get the full value of that herbal product. Like St. John's work with Hyperacin, which I wrote a book about, you want the full spectrum of the St. John, the whole plant with all the synergistic um, other um, products in it, and it's called the entourage effect in the CBD world. Okay. So I still don't understand your, your uh, comment. No, it's not, it's not mine. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm, repeating, I'm repeating Dr. Kazarian's that it is, uh, uh, this is his opinion, or, or maybe... No, no, it's his opinion that, that it was the you should have isolate? No, 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 no. The, 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 the THC component was inflammatory. That you need to avoid the THC part of a CBD regimen. Yeah, so the whole the whole extract, which is called full spectrum, does have less than 0.3% THC, which can actually accumulate in the system. And if you're a military or a cop, it's not a good idea because you can get tested for it. Um, but that slight amount is, doesn't really have, it hasn't been shown to have much of an effect, but you can also get broad spectrum, which is minus that THC, except they have to do another little bit of processing yeah. to take it out. So if you want to have I think that's what he's referring to. Is more process. Yeah, I think that's what he's referring to. Is okay, that, that, that's not what I heard. So oh, I just okay. Yeah, because I think what people are buying is CBD oil in the 7-Eleven, perhaps, has other stuff in it. It's all that. I, I don't know what the other stuff is. I, I don't think, I, that doesn't make sense. Okay. So one thing I wanted to bring into the conversation that we rarely like to do in pediatrics is the role of parents in their state of mind, their state of health. As caregivers, whether you're a father or mother, when you're centered, when you're healthy, your children thrive much more. And when we get anxious because the child is sick, it becomes this vicious cycle. Or because you're sick, the child really mirrors that effect of, of your parent, of, of the parent. So it's really important as a, as a care, as a healthcare provider for pediatrics, is sometimes to have that difficult conversation with your parents. Um, how are you doing? Many times what I'll do with, with children is I'll see the mom is a complete mess because a child is sick, which is totally normal. Of course, your child is sick, you're like, what can I do for my child, right? So what I tell many times to these parents is, let me treat you first. Your child's gonna be fine. Children have amazing ability to heal with just a little touch, a little medicine, a little herb, a little diet change. We parents, we adults, take a little longer because we're kind of bogged down with life's experiences. So what I'll many times do is I'll ask the parent to come in to get treated so that they can get centered, they can get healthy. And once they get healthy, then their energy opens up again and they can see their child and say, Oh, okay, so maybe he had a little too much milk. I'll stop it today. Said, oh my God, he had this milk and he's gonna die tomorrow. We gotta change that. So the more the unit of the family is healthy, with, as we say, energy flowing through, the child's gonna get better. So that's a really important conversation or things to think about when you're treating children is how's the family, how are the caregivers, what's their, their sense of self, their health, their relationship with children. And like he was saying, or was it you, yeah, like the trauma, it was a, um, John, sorry. Um, trauma. Trauma is a big part. We think children are born 
perfect, to, to an extent children are born perfect, right? Mm -hmm. But if the mother's health was unhealthy when they were pregnant, it passes on. We know with intergenerational trauma, it goes from one generation to the next. And if the parent doesn't want to change that trauma and how they respond to that trauma, it passes on to the child. So if you know that you've been traumatized for whatever reason, it could be as small as something or massive as Holocaust or Japanese American internment experience, whatever it may be, but if you're willing to change how you respond to trauma, mm -hmm. your child will change. And there's a great book by um, the uh, uh, psychotherapist Dan Siegel, I think is his name. He has some great books to read, both from how you can help a child versus how you can heal so that you can help a child. So it becomes a whole family unit when you treat a child. And when the child gets better, the parent gets better. But if the parent gets better, the child gets better faster. Um, how about the treatment of autism? I know Dr. Peckler, he, that's one of the things that he treated a number of kids for. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk about how you work up a kid with autism. Uh, one type usually, of usually uh, so children with autism, we know from studies already that they usually they got inflamed, <coughs> inflamed, their brain is inflamed, uh, they have developed some bacteria yeast in, in the gut, they have nutritional deficiencies, some of that because of uh, imbalances in bacteria yeast and viruses in the gut. They may have viral infections that are neurotropic with the, that uh, our uh, predisposition to infect the nervous tissue. So usually, uh, in general, I look at the diets, number one. Um, sometimes it's difficult because you know, children just, you know, especially children with, with autism, they just want to eat five things. So to broaden, it, broaden it up, um, you may need behavioral therapy involved a lot. Um, to, to help the child and the, sometimes even the family, you know, to to introduce all, all the two. Do you find heavy metals are an issue? Right, right. Um, usually the, from, uh, I, you know, it just depends on the uh, parent's budget. I, I discuss from the first appointment that what do we have, you know, what kind of budget do we have? Do we have uh, money, you know, do we have budget for heavy metal testing? Do we have budget for uh, gut testing? Do we have uh, budget for organic, uh, organic acid testing? So uh, nutritional testing and um, uh, food sensitivity testing. So looking at, at uh, all of that, and a lot of times, uh, because I train in uh, environmental toxicology, you know, um, you can, uh, deduce, you know, what may be exposed to based on what the family, you know, from the intake form, what they being, you know, what they have at home, what they're using at home. So that starts, you know, may, do we need to do the testing you know, on all those things, or do we just need to remove them from the home? Start with that, and um, it just really depends, you know, how I try not to overwhelm. Uh, Appearance with uh, autism because there's so many things that needs to be done. So you start with whatever they can usually, you know, and and address the most immediate needs. You know, is there hyperactivity? Is there inattention? Is there uh, 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 sleep issues? So you start what are some of the most common nutritional deficiencies that you see? Um, I've seen magnesium. I see zinc. Uh, okay. Vitamin D is probably number one. I, every kid I test uh, with autism without. They're right in the as well. So that's number one usually. Uh, so what would be a good target for getting the vitamin D? So for children with autism, after uh, up to 100 would be uh, probably uh, would be good. Uh, mm -hmm. Typical children, under typical children, probably 50 to 70 is probably good. It's just a bit about the range that you consider safe. But I found uh, when we reach that range, uh, you know, and again, if you try not to up over supplement and try to get the kid outside and be in the sun um, and, and heal the gut so they can absorb uh, vitamin D from natural sources. And what I've seen is that you know, they just stop being sick, they, they, they concentrate more, they have energy and so on and so forth. Uh, but in general, the eczema goes away, inflammation goes away in general. Um, are, are there any other particular nutritional supplements that you find to be helpful? Uh, so it's it's it, a lot of anti-inflammatories. Um, so fish oil is number one, definitely. CBD, uh, again, if it's uh, clean and affordable, definitely. Um, uh, you, magnesium is 
also usually a good, very good multivitamin, uh, 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 broccoli extracts, uh, sulforaphane, uh, all of those that decrease inflammation in, in the brain and in, in the nervous tissue. Uh, and a lot I work a lot on the gut uh, because uh, we find uh, there's so many imbalances, so much inflammation there that uh, once that's fixed, a lot of times all the other issues are usually fixed. Uh, so I have a quick question. Um, follow up. Um, what test do you use for managing mental testing? Um, you, you can do a few doctor's data. Uh, usually you can do provoked or unprovoked. Um, again, you have to be very, very careful mm -hmm. because uh, if, you get, if you do a provoked, you, you take a chelator and you give it to your child. If, if the chelator goes into uh, nervous tissue and grabs the metal, it can inflame the child even more for months. You know, there's instances. Of so that. what about just doing serum, which is yeah, probably yeah, serum is usually the one I go to. Usually you know, the urine or serum I usually go to uh, first ones, and I I did find um, uh, lead, you know, small amounts, you know, uh, basically one milligram. Which is, I don't, we don't know where it's coming from, could be anything, but that's the detective where we start looking into things and where it comes from. Um, just for those of you who don't know about provoked urine, is everybody familiar with provoked urine testing for metals? Basically, the, the concept is, is that the person has ingested or the kid has ingested the metals and now they're stored somewhere in the body. So if you check the serum level, it's not necessarily going to show up. So you give them an oral chelating agent and the idea is it's going to pull the metals out from where it's being stored and then you collect their urine. So you give them something like DMSA on a one-time dosage and then you collect their urine, say, for like six hours. I have a quick question regarding that. So um, I have been recommending hair metals um, analysis, um, but I, I'm wondering what your the panel's thought is on drawbacks to that. Um, I have been hesitant to, to use a chelating agent on, on kids for adults. I'm fine with that. Um, but uh, the other so the other question is stool. Like Great Plains great, great, great Laboratory also has a stool metals test. Um, I just ordered that for the first time. I'm going to see how, how that works um, for a kid. But hmm. any thoughts on uh, advantages and drawbacks of those? Because I don't like to poke kids, first of all. Um, and then I'm hesitant to use a chelating agent. So I usually stick to the hair metals, but I'm going to maybe play around with the stool and see how that goes. Yeah, it's a hard question because it, there's not a ton of times where you get to do both, so you can't really compare them. And in general, when you read the research, each metal is a little bit different as to where it's going to be stored best. But in, in a lot of them, by the blood, is it's going to be better. But in, in, in it's poking kids, so sometimes you, you do what's more reasonable, and the hair is going to be cheaper, and it's really easy to do for kids. So it, it might be something just to give you some information in general. And then your, your, your follow-up question that has to be, you know, what are you going to do with the information when you get it? So if you're not going to be doing any heavy chelation type stuff, then just doing a hair and getting some information about that there is some metals in the body is all that you need mm -hmm. to be able to convince the parents that you can use some sort of protocol of detox, even if it's just through foods and, and smoothies and turmeric and things like that, where you're going to be trying to pull out very slowly or pull you the, the zeolites, the TRS, things like that that are more benign and generally don't cause a lot of issues, then you don't really need the blood work. Or if you do something in the hair and you get something that comes up, you can be very targeted and just do two or three of those in the blood later. Do you, do you ever use like uh, some of the protocols that are used for adults, like uh, glutathione plus uh, binding agents, like charcoal? Uh, sometimes. I mean, rarely for me, I usually send them over to like an naturopath or other people to do it. It's hard when you're a physician because there's certain like, rules and standard of care, I think, for, for a lot of people. So they, they Is there a standard of care for heavy metals? Well, there is. It just would be not to do it, right? Unless right. they're really, really sick. Okay. <laughs> so you, you run into the problem of you can do it, but then if there's a big issue later, then you have to really defend why you did that. Um, and, and when you're doing that on a kid, there's not really a lot of standard of care, unless, yeah, obviously, there's a super high lead level or in the hospital and they're doing IV chelation. So it's not that you can't do it, it just you know, more falls into the, the minority care as opposed to the standard of care. Whereas I think a lot of naturopaths, they do that more commonly in terms of you know, doing IV medications, doing things that are a little bit different because people are seeking that out. So it's not that you can't do it. I, I haven't done a ton of that. I usually keep it more on the basic side and pass it off 
to someone. And also, it also comes down to experience, too. So you really, if you're going to do this, especially if you're going to go doing it a lot, you want someone that does this every day, because you know, there's a big difference between, just like if you're saying with a surgeon, right? If, if someone's doing detoxification every day, that's where I want to send my kids so they would be able to recognize the issues and go up and down. But it's not something you should be doing willy-nilly, okay, let's do some high, heavy dose chelation on some child, because there, there certainly can be a lot of side effects from that. Right, sure, but you know, the current protocols, like you know, using a, a binding agent like charcoal is gonna be have less traumatic than using an oral chelating agent. What about using low-dose immunotherapy? Has anybody used that? Mm -hmm. I, I personally do not, but I, I begin to conference with where it's shown that's very helpful. Yeah. It, oh. Quick segue into the brain part for a second again. Um, for autism spectrum especially, communications to serve. These, this is a this is an area of, uh, I have a lot of knowledge of this. I have my own daughter, obviously, and, and hundreds of kids who come after her. The brain needs to communicate well. Kids with uh, on the autism spectrum are have um, too many brain cells, the pruning's not happening right, it's a neuro, neurodevelopmental problem. And the quicker uh, a parent can get on a neurofeedback regimen, the better. Uh, the quicker, like anything else. Um, these kids need the hypersensitive, we're talking about food hypersensitivities. They all need three things. They all have to be white. You know, it's tater tots and french fries and I don't know, whatever. But I mean, this is, uh, what? Mac and cheese. The mac and cheese, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, I've seen kids with that, with that palate. Um, as that, we can help that hypersensitivity start to diminish. It's, it's, it's brain-based, you know, I don't like the texture of broccoli. So it's now ingrained in them somehow. By, ex, by, by helping reformat their, their brain's perception of sensory information, that palate will start to expand. All of a sudden, kids start eating better. It's gonna help all you guys as their diet starts to improve. Because that's a huge one. Diet is vital. I'm, I'm with you 100% on this. But the brain has an important task to be done here, especially when you're dealing with spectrum disorder. I can't say that enough. And it's really hard to sit with these parents because I know what's ahead of them. My daughter's probably done 400 hours of training over 15 years. We do it sporadically. It's not over. She's 25. She's still, her brain is still forming even to this day. I just did another brain map on her. We're gonna do some more. This is not done yet. That's part of the syndrome. It's, there's no escaping it. It's a really, really, it's the hardest thing I work with by far. Um, so um, speaking of uh, lab tests, um, we're right in the middle of flu season. And I don't know if you guys all know about this. I know some of you, hey Jeff, I know some of you guys know about BioFire and some of you don't. So you need to know about it. It's a test that uh, tests many of the acute virus and bacteria that are out there. And it's a 24 hour turnaround. So I work for a lab, mine's, I work for University Labs, and we have it, other labs have it as well. But it's 24 hour turnaround. So you, you know, someone comes into your office, it's Thursday, you swab, it's a swab too. It's a, a gastrointestinal or upper respiratory swab. And you send it out, you get results in 24 hours. That's pretty awesome, I mean, that's really great. So if you guys are interested in that, you know, come and see me after and I'll tell you all about it, okay? Thank you. Um, I was going to address the LDI question. I don't, I don't have a ton of experience with it, but I did uh, go to one of the conferences at uh, where the guy, uh, was it Ty, uh, the guy who, um, yeah, Ty Vince. Yes, Ty yeah. thank you. He, he's, he spoke about it, and then uh, in the office where I trained in, we used it quite a bit. So his take on it is about 70% effective. Um, for some people, it works amazing. Um, it does tend to, as we're talking about biofeedback, it tends to be a slower process. Um, people don't see results within a week or two often it's going to take a, a while but um we it was pretty crazy we took all kinds of cases from Lyme disease to you know neuro implement inflammatory type processes um to you know auto all kinds of autoimmune and um i would say i would say that probably reflected about the efficacy rate we saw in our office too it was about that 70 percent range um, but some things that you we didn't find 
it, it didn't budge with anything else, it would move with the LDI, the LDA, so. Right. Yeah. Dr. Varani, who spoke at our meeting, I mentioned on autism, and she uses that quite a bit. And actually, she spoke at one of our meetings of, uh, maybe a year and a half ago just about uh, LDI. You can find that video on my YouTube page as well. Okay. I can say a little bit about autism. I, I treat a boy who has autism and seizures. And prior to coming to me, um, he was doing ABA and he wasn't really making much change. He kept backsliding. Every time he'd take a couple steps forward in terms of improvement, he'd step back. But once he started coming to me, because in Chinese medicine, again, we're about getting the energy to flow better and even brain synapses, because if your energy flows, it also goes to the brain, it goes to the gut, it's, it's a whole system. Um, after about a year and a half of treatment, uh, they retested for his IED. He, his numbers had significantly improved. I think it was like he had gone from being about a six-month-old child. Uh, he was about five at the time. He went up to about a two-year-old, mm -hmm. just a year and a half treatment. So if you guys have children that are suffering from autism, consider incorporating Chinese medicine uh, providers into their health care because we really can make a difference. What happens many times is their, their diet, uh, excuse me, their um, appetite improves and the defi again, defecation improves. Um, so when that happens, their sleep improves. So when those three things, because we need to eat, sleep, improve, right? Next to breathing, those are the three things we humans have to do and that's what babies do all the time. If those, one of those three or all those three things aren't happening, how can a child thrive or improve even with any kind of care they're getting? So with Chinese medicine care, we get those three things working, the systems working, so other things that are already in place start to work a lot better. Oh. Yeah, I think Dr. Barbara Kowski talked about the Magnificent Seven, you have to eat ray, poop ray, um, sleep ray, think ray, um, yep. I forget the others. So any pointers for infant eczema um, in terms of gut healing, what kind of things, aside from say, fish oil probiotics, would you use both from probiotics um, on top of the regular kinds that they're taking like 50 billion a day already? And how early can you do stool testing? Because then usually it's for two years or older, and if they're, but then usually they have eczema when they're six months, three months. Two good questions there. So I think the first thing I think about would be what the baby is eating. So a lot of the times, especially if it's a formula fed kid, they're gonna have some sort of sensitivity, so whether it's to some of the proteins, uh, whether it's to some of the crap in the formula, especially a lot of the American formulas, if you look at the ingredients, it's not the best. Um, a lot of people are getting issues with corn syrup these days, so sometimes just switching up the formula can make a huge difference, whether it's eczema or reflux or any of the first two, three months issues. Do you have a favorite formula that's more hypoallergenic? American? Not really. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the families use Holly or Hip from Europe. Um, the downside using European formulas is that we don't always get all the information that's going on there, so if there's a problem, we might not know about it. But in general, all of their products are going to have a higher standard than American. Um, you know, good Gerber, good start is organic. But there's not like really a really good formula here. I, I think um, Cabrita is coming out with a coat formula for babies now, so there actually will be a coat formula in America, but I don't know. It's already available. Is it available now? Yeah. Okay. Do you prefer goat over cow? For Not necessarily, but it's just things that are smaller batch tend to be better. And all the big, all the formulas are made by big companies. There's only a few. It's super hard to make a formula, so they have a lot of stuff in them. So I don't know if goat's better. Some people do better on goat. Some people do exactly the same. But I think it's more about switching up formulas. So if you're having an issue with one, even if it's a similar one, try a different brand. And if you're really having issues, then you can go down to the more broken down protein formulas. So there's things like Alimentum or Neocade or other other. More broken down protein. Is that like right, the uh, version of elemental diet for kids? Exactly. So, so you're breaking down the proteins to. So there, there's different levels, three levels basically. But you go down the chain of a little bit more broken down. A lot of kids do fine with that, but it tastes really bad and it gets more expensive as you go down. Um, but there are some kids with really bad eczema where they do have a milk protein allergy or they have a significant sensitivity to it, and they go and do the milk and they're fine. So I think that's the first place to start because that's where you can get the most bang for your buck. 
Um, and then you also have the issue with if we were talking about a baby, well, how much supplements can you really do? Nothing's been tested really on babies other than vitamin D, right? So you can certainly do that. You can do probiotics. And then there, you know, uh, Nordic makes some fish oils that you can give to babies, so you could do that. Um, and then anything else that you want to try, for the most part, the uh, homeopathics goes outside of standard, you know, way outside of it, but you can still try things, people do. And then you go for like lotions, you can do castor oil, you could do coconut oil, you could do calendula cream, so those are usually the things that you do. And it does get better with that, and then obviously the regular Western treatments like hydrocortin. Yeah. <laughs> From Chinese medicine, you can actually bathe babies in Chinese herbs, uh, liquid forms. Um, many times what happens with babies who have eczema is if you bathe them in these Chinese herb baths or even put them in onesies soaked with the Chinese herb, the skin is the largest organ in the body. So if the skin can absorb these therapeutic herbs into the skin, it heals the skin much faster than only trying to work from the inside out. So many times what you can do is do everything like what Dr. Walsh is saying, but then also incorporating these Chinese herbal baths it really does wonders, and within a week, the skin has a complete turnaround. And when the skin heals, then now you know that the inflammatory process in the body is like 80% reduced. The body can then now start to heal the gut. Because if the skin is burning, and you're trying to heal the gut, there's too much fires that the body's trying to, to burn out or, or you know, kill. So when you can address it topically using these types of Chinese herbs, and then do the dietary stuff, Amazing. And the other, the other thing I want to add on, because we're talking about the skin, is think about every single thing that touches your baby's skin, because mm -hmm. there's so many products that you can have an irritation or sensitivity to. So every cream, if you look at a lot of the, you know, we have eczema to use like Eucerin or Aveeno. You know, and some, for people, that's fine. But if you look at the label, there's lots of stuff in there. So some kids have a lot of trouble with that. Um, if you're, you know, looking around your home, what, what's, what clothes do they have? What are you using as your detergent for their clothes? What soap are you using for them? All these things are good to think about, and usually I usually tell people to just try to switch everything up or think about every single thing, because that might not be the reason why it's happening, but it might be contributing to it. And like most things with inflammation, you don't always have to figure out exactly what it is. If you do, great, it's dairy, it's awesome, but usually you're not gonna figure it out. So you just think about what things can you, you can decrease the inflammation, and if you can get it down 1% here, and 1% here, and 1% here, and you clean the air a little bit, and you, then you get to a point where their body is able to function, and it gets them back in balance. And so sometimes that's doing little supplements, changing up the environment, changing up their diet, whatever it is, you get to that point where their body's like, oh, okay, now I can deal with this. Mm -hmm. And that's when you see the big improvements happen. And if you can frame that for your families, and it's not a direct line, but it's a slow process going back in the right way, it's not the same thing as using hydrocortisone. Okay, that's gonna make it better. And sometimes that's a useful thing to do, but you have to let their body get back into balance. And by thinking about all the things, that's where you really get the most bang for your buck, and that's where you get success. And that's why you hear everybody has such different opinions, because there isn't a right answer to most of this stuff. There is no one way. Yeah. Just try different things and see what works, and do a little bit. And, and you know, when, when you know, Ben's asking about like what's the first, it, it's different every single time. It really is, and it's, you try one thing, you go up on it. If it's not working after a month or two, try a second thing. Um, think about the things you can change really easily, and just keep going, and if you're patient, you're going to get success. If you give a medication to someone that you don't need it, you're going to create other problems. That's, that's just, it's a different paradigm, but it's not an easy paradigm because there's no textbook. There's no strategy. There's nothing. There's not a lot even in adults, but there's nothing in kids. So that's what we have to create. <laughs> How often do you find that mold is uh, factor? Uh, I mean, for my patients, this doesn't tend to be a huge factor, but it certainly it certainly happens. A lot of times, for when it's going to be a mold issue, it's usually the parents find it when they're doing their own testing, and then you do some similar testing, you find the same. Um, you do find it sometimes in stool testing, but I think a lot of kids are pretty resilient, so they don't necessarily, at least the younger kids, it's not necessarily the primary issue. Um, Every once in a while, you find it how to treat it. I just want to whoa, sorry. <laughs> That's really, I'm sorry. Um, I was living in Europe last year, and I at one point was in Amsterdam visiting friends, and the girl I was staying with worked for Deno. Um, and she was doing the raw, like the ordering of the raw materials. They ordered the wrong, like, two-ton batch of milk powder. 
supposed to be organic, it was GMO'd. They sold it as organic formula and labeled it anyways. Okay. So, and that's a huge company, and I think they're one of the leaders in Europe for like new organic stuff. I think it was company whatever. To the, every day I was hearing about the drama, but I just wanted to piggyback on the comments of the formula is like we can't even really trust labeling anymore. So if we're recommending formula as practitioners, we have to be so careful with what we're choosing because we can't trust the labels. We really have to know the products. You can, so, it's, so the cool. products and the labeling is so scary. It's scary. I mean, if you look at all the studies that are coming out now, you know, they look at the rice and there's arsenic. They look at this. Every time they do any study, they find all sorts of stuff. And anytime they look at supplements, half of them don't have what they say. So I think that's just something that we have to consider. And you always try to go with the best brand possible, but just assuming that whatever is going on might not actually be what's in there. Just keep cognizant of that. But it's not all doom and gloom. You know, it's always about incremental change. And if you're making incremental improvements, then that's that's good. Yeah. So I can attest to things like have a child at three, two, three months who is uh, colicky, mom's not sleeping for three months, everybody's crying 24-7, uh, eczema, and uh, you just work and, and see, uh, a lot of times I ask you know, parents help, you know, <laughs> at that time, because if mom is especially mom breastfeeding, when we work, uh, I work well, through mom, on the child, basically. A lot of times moms do not want to be uh, treat, you know, have a treatment, have a, fill out a separate form and, and do all, all that. So I usually tell the mom, um, you will get, you just need to change the diet um, to this and this and this, <clears throat> remove the toxins, uh, have a probiotic, have a fish oil, uh, have a good multivitamin, you know, prenatal, postnatal uh, multivitamin, and so on and so, so forth. It usually within um, the one, the one patient I had, uh, within three days, she said 70% of her colic was gone. You know, and then within a month, everything was gone. And now, uh, this, this child is nine months and walking already. Mm -hmm. So, so there's an instant change. It's just, and it's super simple, basically. You just, if you nourish the body, everything will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. If you nourish your soul, if you nourish your brain, uh, if you rest, and so on and so forth. Especially kids, they, like you said, they, they're so quick to remember. <laughs> But what you mentioned postnatal, is there actually such a thing as a postnatal multivitamin? That's a cool concept. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much pretty much pretty much. Oh, okay. <laughs> Most people just take their pre postnatal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they can label it different so you can pay more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am wondering, um, I've heard about camel milk. I don't know anything about it. I'm wondering if you guys have heard about it before. Most of the studies that look at the different kinds of milk usually find camel milk is the lowest allergy profile of all. It's the heaviest of It's the what? Heaviest. Heaviest. Yeah, I think Dr. Barsani said the same thing about camel's milk, and it just so happened at the meeting he was at. The, guy who's a distributor for camel's milk was in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> well, I also wonder, like, you know, do we not drink camel's milk so we don't have allergies? <laughs> we haven't developed them yet. I don't know. Do you with allergies? Do you notice that a lot? Depends which kind. So a, a lot. So the answer to the question is yes, you can. What was the no question? So, um, do kids grow out of their food allergies? So a lot of times they do. It depends on which allergy. If it's a if it's a milk sensitivity, a lot of kids do seem to improve a lot as they get older. If you take things out of the diet and reintroduce it later, a lot of times things get better. But things like peanuts don't tend to improve. Usually, if you have something like that, you have it for life. But it's possible some people. Uh, it also depends how bad the allergy is too. Um, but some foods you do, some foods you don't, but they do tend to get better as you get older. Can you take a picture of us on the stage? <laughs> <laughs> Whisper it some more. <laughs> Any other questions? Actually, I have a question. What's, is there a consensus in the community, the, the naturopathic community or functional medicine community about melatonin? 
It's a, I'm asked about it all the time. Everybody I know takes it. They're giving it to their kids. I'm not so sure. It's a hormone. Yeah, it's uh, apparently, everything that I, I've heard is that even though it is a hormone, there's no feedback the way you get from other hormones, so there's no down regulation. Um, but it's connected to the, cortis to the cortisol system. I mean, it's the flip side. Yeah. Yeah. It would kind of be surprising to me that there wouldn't be a cortisol in It's that. really all over the place. Yeah. Right? I mean, I, I, know, I, know, I, I talked to one doctor, a functional medicine doctor, who takes 50 milligrams a day. Wow. And wow. based on one study that showed that there was this potent anti-aging effect. Um, and um, I just talked to somebody else. Uh, who was I talking? To um, and she said that she uses like uh, a half a milligram, like three hours before bed, and then like you know one or you know two milligrams before bed, and that's really physiologically all you should use. With, so. with, with supplements, for most of them, the information is kind of all over the place. I mean, you can read one study; it will tell you it's amazing. And the next study, it won't. With melatonin, a lot of the research coming out is talking about not being on it forever and getting you know, more dependent on it. I think, in general, my advice for my families and patients with supplements is a supplement, by that definition, is a supplement. It's supposed to be something that you do for a certain amount of time to bring your body back into balance, and then your body's supposed to do what it's supposed to do. So if you're having a lot of trouble sleeping, if you're going to choose between melatonin and Zero some cereal well. or some <laughs> medication, I probably would start with melatonin. Absolutely. I think that's fine. Absolutely. But you're not doing it to be on that for the rest of your life. If it helps you get into a better pattern, you can come back up. I think that's fine. But it's, everything is about what is the most minimal harm. Right? And so you don't just do it just because if your kid's not a good sleeper because you, know, you, don't want them, you don't want to put the work in to have them be a good sleeper. It's not a good time to do melatonin. But if you have a really bad sleeper or you go away on a trip and it's going to be that or taking your medication, that to me is, is a better option. But you, you can try to start with the other, start with essential oil, start with a good nighttime routine. If you've done all of those things, then yeah, okay, fine. Yeah. You know, a little bit of melatonin is probably not going to yeah, Probably three milligrams is the most common dosage. Uh, but I think the blue light uh, thing that you, you just mentioned with the electronics and you know is, is a major major issue with all these kids. With especially they they got their phones, they got their iPads, their laptops, you know. Right, and they, 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 almost every single thing in medicine has come back to the same story of start with the foundations, have your discussions with them, go through your history, do the most benign things first, make sure they're not on their iPads exactly what we're saying. Then you can think about you know, maybe homeopathics, then you can think about supplements, and then you can think about medication. And that to me is the right order, and that way if you need a medication, you do it, but you try everything else first, and you don't jump straight to the medication, because they do a lot of good. You know, there's a lot of cancer medications that cure you from cancer. There are, you know, we have a bad pneumonia, we take antibiotic, we don't die. So there's good medications and the hospital do great things, but we just way overuse it because it's the only thing that we learn. It's the first option. Whereas there's so many other things available in the world and so many other practitioners that you know so much more than anybody in the Western medicine about all of these things. So we just have to work together. That's really what it comes down to.